Um, thank you for coming to our second keynote speaker of the conference. Um, Sebastian Mo is going to introduce um, our second speaker. All right. Good, good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for being here. It's good uh, to uh, see a room full of human beings. Um, so our guest today is Sarah Jackson from the University of uh, Pennsylvania, and it is an immense pleasure and great honor to welcome her as a keynote speaker to the 53rd edition of our annual conference, and as we've kept mentioning since yesterday, our first in-person in gathering since 2019. Much to everyone's regret, Dr. Jackson cannot be with us in person today, but despite the difficult circumstances she finds herself in, she nonetheless offered to give her keynote at address via Zoom, and we are extremely grateful to her for that. Dr. Jackson is Associate Professor of Communication at the Annenberg School for Communication, a faculty affiliate at the Department of Africana Studies at UPenn, and a current Andrew Carnegie Fellow at the Carnegie Corporation in New York. But this alone is not enough to paint the full picture of what kind of scholar Dr. Jackson is. So I would like to say a few words of introduction, and for that I'd like to start with the times we're living in, from the standpoint of race relations and beyond that of democracy itself. For over more than a decade now, this disruptive power of new communication technology has allowed historically marginalized groups to push for racial, gender, and labor justice with significant success. Meanwhile, economic dislocations and the sense of cultural displacement experienced by some segments of society have been the breeding ground for the resurgence of authoritarianism and reactionary sentiments. This has prompted a backlash of unprecedented magnitude which made such marginalized groups the primary targets of renewed oppression. And while this pushback makes scholarship and intellectual endeavors even more crucial, uh, as the president of this university and the president of our association forcefully argued yesterday, academics on both sides of the Atlantic have now become the targets of a relentless intimidation campaign designed to challenge and undermine their scientific authority and legitimacy. Dr. Jackson's research strikes at the core of these two intertwined phenomena. A, scholarship, a scholar of the public sphere, Dr. Jackson has published more than 20 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters in which she reconceptualizes counter-public spheres and counter-public activism. In this body of work, she explores the ways in which traditionally marginalized groups, such as people of color, women, LGBTQ individuals, and the underprivileged, harness the affordances of the hybrid media system to create alternative media spaces and form what she calls networked counterpublics, where they articulate and promote a repertoire of contentions to give visibility to their lived experiences and affect change. She makes a strong case for the legitimacy of these marginalized voices, forcefully arguing that through their labor, these groups have been at the forefront of a relentless fight for democracy that has benefited society in its entirety. Most recently, Dr. Jackson has been the, le the leading author of Hashtag Activism, Networks of Race and Gen Gender Justice, a book co-written with Moya Bailey and Brooke Fuqua Wells and published in 2020. Received to great critical acclaim by both the academic community and the general public, Hashtag Activism meaningfully complicates our understanding of the logics and dynamics that animate networked counterpublics and is poised to become a canonic text. It received the International Communication Applied Research Award in 2020 and the National Communication Association's Diamond Ac Academic Book in 2021. But Dr. Jackson's commitment to social and racial justice goes beyond her engagement with ideas. Since 2019, she has been the co-director of the Media Inequality and Change Center, or Mike Center, a joint venture between the Annenberg School for Communication and Rutgers University. The center is committed to studying the political economy of social problems, media, and democracy while engaging local activist projects and drawing connections with national and international social movements. Her talk today is titled The Light of Truth, Counterpublic Canons, and the Case of Black Media Makers and draws from her current book project on black media makers' contribution to bridging the gap between truth and ideals in the United States through her historical and cultural lens. The book is uh, titled A Second Sight, How the Writer's Wonder and Revolutionary Vision of Black Media Making Can Deliver Us from Darkness. 
It will be published by Marina HarperCollins in 2023. So without any further ado, please join me as we welcome Sarah J. Jackson. Historical dynamics of public 
of public spheres, excuse me. For squires who deliberately grounded her analytical approach in terms of a synthesis between feminist and African-American scholars, to understand how public spheres are structured and navigated requires analysis of the history of social structures and the power of societies to grant certain groups the ability to engage in communicative <coughs> participation. Relatedly, Squires, along with others in this tradition, was deeply attuned to the institutional conditions that create and support participation in public spheres. In this body of work, scholars analyze social structures and the organizational and institutional basis of heterogeneous publics, including differently positioned identity groups, and understand the forms of publics as the outcome of social hierarchies. As Squires described in her framework, quote, salient aspects of the public sphere might include the following, the history of their relationship to the state and dominant publics, how diverse in a, a particular public is, what sorts of institutional resources are available to a collective, what these institutional relationships are in terms of politics, the economy, and media institutions of the dominant society, and how their modes of communicative and cultural expression are different from those of other publics and the entities within public and economic society. This in turn leads Squire's sophisticated understanding of different types of African-American publics as they are embedded in social hierarchies, an approach that is often completely missed from accounts of contemporary public spheres in the media. For Squire's, publics are defined not by identity, but by relations between groups in a social structure. Given their position in a social hierarchy, groups have different possibilities for strategic creation and use of publics and discursive spaces including to debate what should constitute the very identity of the group itself. For instance, what Squires calls enclave publics form when groups are denied entry to visible publics and are separate, often hidden spaces of resistance that develop public transcripts when interacting with dominant groups. For Squires, the concept of counterpublics, the concept I use heavily in my work, is defined vis-a-vis -vis the dominance and emergence that exists when there's a decrease in the oppression that forces on place. The goal of studying counterpublics then has long been attached to a moral imperative to recognize and analyze unequal power relations, interrogate social structures, and center recognition and analysis of groups and collectives who have been deliberately and structurally embargoed from institutions of civil society in the public sphere. And in my case, of course, these institutions focus heavily on the study of media. It is in this theoretical intervention that has led me to center the importance of black media makers in American culture and politics. For black media makers represent the debates, needs, and experiences of a black counter public that remains at the margins even as US conditions of racial apartheid shift and evolve. Black testimonies are agile, clever, and defiant because that is the only thing they can be. They would be silenced otherwise. As Bell Hooks argues in her essay, Marginality of the Site of Resistance, true curiosity, growth, and political reinvention flourish at the margins. The places where the rules and language of dominant life, the norms and values that have failed the United States have never quite applied. Or as it goes in many black American folk tales of Br'er Rabbit, black stories are often ahead of the mob, whether before the mob takes notice, as the mob gives chase, or after the mob has forced the witness into exile. The result is change, big and small wins, even when the mob fails to notice. So I want to share a couple examples with you. Born enslaved in Mississippi in 1862, journalist Ida B. Wells exemplifies the long spirit of innovation, leadership, and truth-telling that typifies the history of black media making in the United States. In addition to owning the free press by, uh, I'm sorry, the Memphis Free Speech, by 1890, she was also the editor of the Evening Star, a regular contributor to the Living Way and a national syndicated columnist. Across these forums, Wells wrote for both black and white audiences, shifting her mode of address for each as necessary and spreading on the truths of the barbarism of lynching, but calling on her various audiences to act to end it. Her job in journalism alone makes her central to stories of American racial progress. Of equal importance, however, is the manner in which she, dis she disseminated the facts 
that she gathered, rendering white supremacist violence visible and undeniable for black Americans used to being gaslit and white Americans used to looking the other way. She was a businesswoman, marketer, a multimedia innovator, as well as a journalist. She organized boycotts, entered alliances and feuds in public to bring new attention to her cause, and went on an infamous speaking tour of England that pitted the chilling wind of the island's disapproval on American institutions who soaked and seethed in response. The New York Times, for instance, infamously called Ivy Wells, quote, a slanderous and nasty-minded mulattress, unquote. In a lesser known moment of media brilliance, and this is the one I put up on the screen for you all, a 30-year-old Wells teamed up with a 75-year-old Frederick Douglass to co-author a pamphlet which they distributed in English, French, and German at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition, protesting the absence of consideration of the Black American contribution to the first World's Fair held in the United States. Rarely considered as contemporaries, Wells and Douglas's pamphlet demonstrates the tenacity, truth-telling, and interventionist spirit of black media-making across generations and political alliances. Wells' career also illustrates the remarkable persistence and artistry required to simply tell black stories to this day. In 2020, she was finally awarded a posthumous Pulitzer Prize for her reporting, and the New York Times expressed regrets about the nasty-minded Lewattress thing. Not two months after Wells received the Pulitzer Prize, however, George Floyd was suffocated for eight minutes and 46 seconds as he begged for his life, and the United States experienced a conflagration that reached far beyond the streets and into newsrooms, production studios, and writers' rooms. <clears throat> At the core of this was the contradiction of a supposedly evolved United States that continues to justify and fund lynch mobs in the form of police and white supremacist militia. As Americans took to the streets led by a new generation of black activists, one black media maker after another published long repressed testimony of professional experiences with editorial hypocrisy, undermining, and erasure, everywhere from local weeklies to Condé Nast to CNN and the New York Times. It begs the question, if the massive civil unrest, discontent, and the backlash that has followed it might have been avoided, had black voices and stories been listened to, centered, and trusted by media executives and government officials long ago. Instead, our country continues to pay the price for this neglect. From the outset, black American media work has been an exercise in epistemological liberation what philosopher Cynthia Nelson called resistance through re-narration. When Samuel Cornish and John Restburn founded Freedom's Journal, the first African-American newspaper in 1827, they wrote, quote, we wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us. Too long has the public been deceived by misrepresentations in things which concern us dearly. From the press to the pulpit, we have suffered much by being incorrectly represented." Unquote. The two editors, and later Frederick Douglass, who founded the North Star in 1847, also resented the paternalism of white abolitionist publications, which spoke for manumission, but fell far short of representing the full humanity of African Americans. Black media was thus established in response to conditions of exclusion, ignorance, and malicious misrepresentation by a white dominant media that legitimized enslavement and other gender realities foisted on African Americans. It necessitated a spiritual commitment to the truth and to telling untold and unfairly told stories in innovative ways. Black reporters and editors were the first, and are still among the only, operating from the foundational assumption that all people who live in the United States are complicated, distinctive, human as white people are. That was and is a revolutionary premise. Early black media makers, while critical of dominant media narratives, were of course by no means liberated themselves in the bodily sense. Indeed, they were constrained by the racial apartheid of their day, they spoke to and for their community, offered critique of the stories told by their white counterparts, and strategically made the case for the rights of African Americans to the same establishment that misunderstood them. 
and they made political headway in their efforts. The pre-Civil War black press greatly influenced abolitionists, especially white radicals like John Brown and other African Americans who worked tireless, tirelessly to free their kin. The reporting for which Ida B. Wells nearly lost her life famously paved the way for anti-lynching legislation. And black newspapers written in cities like New York and Chicago and smuggled across the Mason-Dixon line by black Pullman porters helped drive the Great Migration as black Southerners moved north in search of the vibrant intellectual and economic life they found in their pages. Black media remained the laboratory and leader of progressive thought on race throughout the 20th century. During World War II, black news newspapers organized the Double B campaign to support victory against fascism abroad and victory through policy against racism at home. And black radio programs played an important role in spreading protest songs and strategic updates during the civil rights movement. In each case, black media makers' subversion required great risk and careful storytelling as they reflected, spread, and crystallized the political demands and cultural values of African Americans. Despite such remarkable contributions to democracy, however, establishment outlets were slow to welcome African American media makers. So-called mainstream newsrooms, film studios, and networks were, and still are, reluctant to honor black media makers as America's national engine of epistemological expansion and innovation. When Lyndon Johnson, President Lyndon Johnson, asked the Kerner Commission to explain the urban unrest that swept the nation in 1968 following the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., they wrote, quote, along with the country as a whole, the press has too long basked in a white world looking out of it, if at all, with white men's eyes and a white perspective. That is no longer good enough. They must make a reality of integration in both their product and personnel. They must report with compassion and depth." Unquote. In the era that followed, stunted media integration would haunt black media makers seeking to offer this compassion and depth. Late in the 20th century, and despite remarkable shifts in our nation's racial politics, Black media makers continue to experience a professionalized form of double consciousness, navigating the divergence of their notions of self and community from the norms and assumptions of a so overwhelmingly white media organizations. To this day, black media makers face countless macro and microaggressions and exclusion at work. Their accounts reveal shocking censorship, Supervisors, editors, and media companies demanding edits, making surprise cuts to black journalists' work, and otherwise changing their stories. Higher up stall on black owned projects, low ball black talent in co contract negotiations, and gaslight black creators about the reasons they're doing these things. News editors, for example, say they're protecting industry norms and relationships with official sources when in fact they're calling white discomfort and excluding black perspectives. The accounts also detail plenty of overt racism, such as this case in which the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette barred its black reporters from covering Black Lives Matter protests. And later, when a Condé Nast business executive demanded that Vanity Fair stop putting so many black people on the cover. More such accounts were shared with me as I worked on the current book project I'm engaged in. For example, comedian Wyatt Sinek who rose to fame working on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, told me about how his supervisors at a different major late night show told him without explanation or empathy or context that he would never be promoted there, a show whose senior writing team was entirely white. None of this, alas, is new. It's what black people have been dealing with in white media spaces for more than 100 years. Yet the powerful entanglement of whiteness and American myth has never been absolute. Cracks have frequently given way to cultural revolutions, and today we are witnessing a new moment of such profound possibility in the United States media culture, largely made possible by the demands and innovation of black storytellers and audiences. Even as today's black media makers face backlash and censorship, the 21st century conditions of the media industry have been remarkably transformed since Ida B. Wells' time. There is an increasing demand for an appointment of black leadership at historically all-white media organizations, 
There are new generations of black media makers opting out of mainstream casts and instead forging their own. There are radical reinventions of identity and demands for audiences once largely ignored. And there are new technologies that have changed long-standing media gatekeeping. As part of the moment of racial reckoning this era has wrought, we are talking widely about the root causes and possible solutions for white supremacy in America. In response to these conditions, black media makers are increasingly and unabashedly demanding and creating something new. In our collective and more than ever urgent attempts to understand the state of U.S. democracy and its tenuous future, black media makers offer us nuance and truth, pleasure and reflection. In journalism and horror movies, comedy and documentary, they offer perspectives that prioritize justice and humanity through an unapologetic grappling with history, the present, and perhaps most importantly, our potential for the future. So take these two examples here. Tommy Lucy Coates' prescient 2014 essay, The Case for Reparations. This work, alongside Coates' 2015 memoir, Between the World and Me, and his 2016 rebooting of Marvel's Black Panther comic, has had remarkable reach in US politics and culture. Mainstreaming national conversations about reparations and racial equality, and challenging our collective vision of heroism in the future. His approach, in each case, from policy intervention to Afrofuturism is carefully executed to invite white Americans closer to the margins while centering black stories. His work is successful at this because of the careful way he interweaves narrative vignettes, journalistic research, memoir, and speculative fiction. And as the son of a military veteran, a former Black Panther and book publisher, Coates' storytelling reflects the nuanced legacy of black adaptation to conflicting American ideals. Similarly, the groundbreaking work of Nicole Hannah Jones on school segregation, including her 2014 investigation of Missouri schools in the wake of the killing of Michael Brown, and her 2016 genre bending reporting on her family search for a New York City school for her daughter, unapologetically challenged white US parents to forego individual narratives of school choice and academic success central to racist educational outcomes. In this argument, she, like Coates on reparations, was pathetic refusing to back down from a truth that has since become increasingly central to national debate about race. In my conversations with her, Joan says that she is most proud of this work, even though she has subsequently become more renowned for the 1619 Project, which I'll, I'll talk about now. In 2019, Hannah Jones held the remarkable uh, 1619 Project, which, if you've seen it, is an innovative multi-platform and investigation and commentary featuring an array of black reporters, scholars, and thinkers connecting American slavery to subjects as diverse as pop music, healthcare, and this morning's traffic jam. The project discards the long, unassailable white logics that have made much of US storytelling about slavery apolitical, objectifying, or part of a grand narrative of progress and saviorism. Instead, it offers reporting, photography, podcasts, poetry, and more to tell the truth about how America's horrific past continues to define its present. As Joan says, the project is, quote, very black, in the way it hones to uncomfortable truths. Amid this curated work and actionable calls for justice, Hannah Jones names the economies of chattel slavery as central to the vision of the founding fathers. While this provocation and intense ongoing denouncements of it were previously contained among ivory tower, tower historians and economists, Hannah Jones' work launched it into popular discourse in the United States. More than three years after the project's debut and after decades of hand-wringing about public divestment from newspapers, the print version of the New York Times Magazine's 1619 project is still sold out. It's incredibly hard to get a physical copy of this because it's, it's so popular. Um, and yet we have also witnessed an intense right-wing backlash that he's used standing for and objections about the mainstreaming of counter-public experiences and stories in the United States. Creative media, too, have been at the forefront of shifting and challenging democratic culture norms in the US. For example, following the celebration of D.W. Griffith's film, Birth of a Nation, which glorified the Ku Klux Klan by Woodrow Wilson at the White House in 1915, 
black filmmaker Austin Show set out to make a film that would correct the narrative of race and violence presented by Brooklyn Nation. In 1920, he released Within Our Gates, an all-white motion picture board of censor, of censors who feared the realistic depiction of white men raping black women and engaging in other forms of racial terror, uh, censored the film in many in many American cities. Of course, you know, Birth of a Nation wasn't censored, but Open Our Gates uh, was censored. Contemporary filmmakers like Abe DuVernay, Barry Jenkins, Jordan Peele, and Ryan Ryan Coogler follow in the footsteps of filmmakers like Rousseau and have worked with ferocity to bring to light contemporary forms of black <coughs> truth telling and to undo myopic and sanitized stories of black urban families, the suburbs, the so-called queer experience, neoliberalism, and the civil rights movement, <coughs> crime and punishment, and more. Consider the contributions of just these four filmmakers since 2015. And these are only one film from each, but they've all actually made an incredible uh, number of films since 2015. From Selma, to The 13th, to When They See Us, to Moonlight, to Bell Station, to Get Out, and many more. Their films, no longer censored, but still up against a largely homogenous and exclusive film industry, have had outspoken in have had, had, excuse me, outsized influence. Among other things, such creative works have bolstered the work of Black Lives Matter activists and informed national consciousness on Black activism and our understandings of justice. These filmmakers interweave this work with a unique level of accessibility for Hollywood directors and writers, redefining authorship and engagement across social media platforms like Twitter and Instagram where they engage with millions of followers choosing everyday black talk, joy, critique, and humor with political education and advocacy. These and other black media makers have what I call a second sight. As W.B. Du Bois described in his classic The Souls of Black Folks, being both black and American results in a double consciousness, one developed and required to survive and thrive within the boundaries of white supremacist logic while being simultaneously excluded from them. Something similar, I argue, in my work can be said of black media makers who tell stories for a nation that clings to ideals of democracy and freedom while never fully granting them to the communities from which they come. Yet this state of exclusion is also an epistemological gift because it allows the sight of what sociologist Patricia Hill Collins calls the outsider within. This site offers a unique relationship to power and knowledge, a perspective born of both distance and intimacy, one in which the landscape revolves itself into something like comprehensibility. For black storytellers then, US values are more complex. Democracy is about full and just inclusion, about making demands of the powerful, about reimagining leadership, about refusing to relent. Freedom involves not just individual choice, but the collective right to be respected, believed, and happy. They question values like objectivity in a white supremacist country fixated on treating a narrow set of perspectives from within an issue, no matter how exclusionary as truth. Black media makers also face the unique charge of telling stories intimate and critical to communities still largely lacking access to the mainstream public sphere. They attempt to tell stories in industries that were founded lacking nuance and which thrived on narratives of mammy, welfare queens, black on black crime, crack babies, and bell curves, all at once, and we still consider truths. That is, if black stories were told at all. As outsiders within both the nation and the media profession, black media makers know better and imagine bigger. They intervene in the violent, myopic whiteness of their industries and of the country, not solely because they see it as a duty, but because truth-telling and telling it ingeniously is a gift that has been honed across generations of black media making. There is a unique kind of joy and satisfaction and triumph and humor woven throughout black media makers' work, a smirk, if you will, of righteousness. In the first two decades of the 21st century, Media industries continue to uh, evince what sociologists have called enlightened or colorblind racism. Diversity in newsrooms stagnated while representation of diversity increased. 
White men are made in the most powerful industry positions, while a few black storytellers push through the roadblocks to gain prominence. Yet black media makers were able to occasionally push through the growing cracks in the facade of established print media. They have doggedly advocated for new and old kinds of stories from their communities to be told, and they harness new media and the growing segmentation of audiences to create new black friend platforms, even as white studio heads and editorial editors openly worry about the relatability and worthiness of these stories to their presumed white audiences. In the media, the wins of the civil rights movement were celebrated in the same breath as stories about the disproportionate impact of the housing crash on black families, of police violence on black bodies, of upticks in hate crimes, and an increasing racialized gap between the rich and the poor. While white media makers naively reveled in their own post-racial headlines about the first black president when Barack Obama was elected, they in the process missed the growing white rage and backlash that would lead to the following president calling neo-Nazis very fine people. Today, and in no small part because of the demands coming from the streets and those from black media makers with the media institutions, we are talking widely about the root causes of our culture's over and covert racism. Media institutions have been called to account alongside other institutions in American life for the, their complicity in sugarcoating and enabling white supremacy. In journalism, for example, a renewed debate led by black media makers has arisen about norms of objectivity that in truth have simply allowed white epistemologies to go in question. As journalist Wesley Lowry recently wrote, since, quote, since American journalism's pivot many decades ago from an openly partisan press to a model of professed objectivity, the mainstream has allowed what it considers objective truth to be decided almost exclusively by white reporters and their mostly white bosses. The views and inclinations of whiteness are, accept are accepted as objective neutral, unquote. Such, of course, is true about all media industries which have for so long centered white stories, white audiences, and the modus operandi that arises from the, these, that they have, rather than respond to critiques of radical transformation, simply been part of a too slow process of industry integration that has largely required black media makers to assimilate to white norms, values, and perspectives. Yet despite these roadblocks, black media makers continue to do what they long have, push these boundaries, create new aesthetics, new vernacular, new stories, canons, and histories drawn from black critical memory and creativity. Ultimately, my work argues that if we are ever going to weaken the stubborn problems of the myopic whiteness described 50 plus years, 50 plus years apart by Lowry and the Kerner Commission, that we, and we being those who have stakes in the US public policymakers, scholars, and industry leaders, must follow the lead of black media makers who have for generations worked to shape our thinking on race and democracy with a radical commitment to truth. This is not to say that black media makers all agree on politics, on race, or even on something like the Mets versus the Yankees. In part, what makes their collective work inspiring is the very visions that create and take up space. Further, I object to the, law, the line engaged by some critics that a new generation of black media makers who adhere honestly to and in defense of their visions are not committed to a free exchange of ideas. Such has been implied in the infamous Harper's letter that suggested the New York Times' James Bennett stepped down from his post due to censorious pressure rather than an overdue reckoning of black truth and activism. And in the criticism faced by the 1690s, King Project, which some, including the former president of the United States, cast as un-American. Those threatened by a move away from the whiteness of traditional media norms and values towards black truth-telling and provocation have built careers in culture wars on arguing that the latter imposes an end to intellectual curiosity and a stifling of contrarian speech. In its most dangerous form, critique of black media makers casts them as seditious. Of course, the truth is the opposite. By rejecting narrow and repressive norms and ideologies, black journalists and creators engage in what Masha Gessner has called, quote, the surprising power of non-compliance, unquote, which as their predecessors have proven, can be downright revolutionary. 
What I hope to do with my work is to shift the public conversation about black media makers away from a focus on hand wringing over media values, representation, and reform that have not served us, and toward ones of black authority, creativity, and canon. As a media scholar, study scholar, I believe this requires me to expand the conversation that oversimplifies what is at stake in current controversies over race and racism, and denigrates black media makers through obsessions with so-called cancel culture and identity politics. The canon of black media encourages more and many stories and centers those that are missing to move us closer to collective moral clarity. It accepts that there is not one master story, there is not one objective, but rather that there are multiple stories that get it right. It asks the powerful to sit and hear the truths of the powerless and to act on them. The truths told by black media makers work to make the United States whole, something media seek in whiteness have failed to do. Black truths and innovation work to pull the United States from its history of racial subjugation and imagine a new, different future. In this moment, truth hangs upon the most innovative and norm-busting forms. It is multimodal, it makes us laugh, educates us, and expands our imagination. It reflects the genius and tenacity of black media makers as, as they have led the way. If Americans have been taught from day one to be a celebratory, for example, of John B. Restroom and Samuel Cornish, the founders of Freedom's Journal, as they are of Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, we might have already overcome our racial demons. If Frederick Douglass were accurately remembered as an innovator who paved the way for both Hunter S. Thompson and David Brinkley, we could be living in a nation in which liberty and justice actually existed for all. If Ida B. Wells' work was taught in journalism and media programs as frequently as Walter Lippmann's, the norms and values of media making would be radically more inclusive. It is not hard, I suggest, to imagine a world in which the centering and celebration of honest stories about race in the United States transforms the nation into something much better. In this moment, we have never had a greater opportunity or imperative to do so. Today's black media makers are identifying, celebrating, and owning their centuries-old cultural inheritance of truth-telling. They are expanding the canon and insisting on their authority. In the process, it is black media makers who can save dying media industries, harness the full potentials of technology, and recenter the humanity of diverse and ignored groups of people. Some say they're listening, others are resistant. But listening requires a change, not just in how we understand the norms of media, but the presuppositions and limits of US civil society and the public sphere. If we all grabbed onto the stories of black media makers, my work is asking, and I'm, I'm asking here today, I wonder where would it lead us? So I'll stop there and um, open up for questions.